All right, how are you guys doing? Come on, bring on some energy. How are you guys doing? There you are. So, day two, uh, I abandoned my, um, let's see. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. So I abandoned my coat, it's just too warm. You know, I saw what happened yesterday. And I was like, yeah, we really need to relax. Um, so what I'm gonna do, you heard a lot about AI, about blockchain, AR, VR, really the set of technologies that we're focusing here. And I'm an economist by training, and I've been in the blockchain space since the past couple of years, and I realized that there were two categories of people, essentially, in these conferences. First, the computer scientists, right, who would actually be building out these products and, and services and platforms. And the second was the entrepreneurs and the business folks who are looking to, you know, deploy the technologies and, and, and make money, change the world. Um, but what was really missing was a macro level perspective on what are the implications of these technologies for our economy, our economic structures, our interactions as economic beings. And we do know that we live in an era of globalization that's driven by technology, right? A new technology comes in, it uh, disrupts industries, it opens new industries, so on and so forth. So that's really what I'm gonna do here. Uh, I'm Navrup Sadev, um, and I'm a fellow at MIT Connection Science at the Media Lab, and I've been engaged in a lot of this thinking over the past couple of years. So what I'm gonna do is leave you with three key ideas at the intersection of blockchain technologies and uh, economics. And, and this sort of goes back to um, you know, previous or other technologies as well and not just blockchain. And, and I'll go more about it. So I was walking through the Muir Woods in San Francisco uh, a couple of uh, months ago. I was giving uh, the keynote address at the Blockchain West Conference and you know, I thought about it, how no matter what you're studying and no matter what you're researching, at the end of the day, you would always be studying the human mind. And, and I'll come back to it. And how it's important to take a systemic view to whatever you're studying. Now, so the first of these ideas that I want to talk about is technological convergence. And that sort of ties into a lot of what we've seen so far and will as well. I think it is not just blockchain, and it's not just AI, and it's not just AR and VR that's going to change the world. In fact, it is the convergence of a host of these technologies that would promise a drastically different future. So what that means, and what kind of tools we are using, uh, at least for me, comes from complexity science. And I've been uh, working on this since the past three years, and I was telling my colleague, it changed my life. Right, definitely my professional life, but also uh, my life in general from when I started learning about complex systems. So I want to take a step back and talk about how convergence is in fact an emergent property of the system. So what that means is when you're looking at parts of the system or when you're examining microagents or individuals or whatever your element of study is, it would be very hard to predict what would happen to the entire system in general. And that is just the nature of these systems, right? An example of complexity in biological systems is like a school of fish uh, that, that's, that's moving together, or birds, or um, in a financial system, uh, you would see convergence. Uh, for example, if you are, <laughs> if you invested in the public markets and the prices are going down, right? Um, it makes sense for you, as a micro-agent, as a participant of the market, to pull your money out before it's worth nothing. However, if everyone does it, then the market crashes, right? There's a run on the market. So that's an example of complexity at play in, in financial systems. So I want to take a step back and talk just very briefly about the characteristics of some of these economic systems. Now, um, let's say a quick show of hands in the room. How many people are have some background in complex systems. Let's, yes, all right, perfect, that's around 20%. So for, for those of us who, who are still learning, uh, I think I'm gonna quickly go over some of the key characteristics. There's no convergence on what the, the definition of a complex system is, but we do know how to recognize them through their characteristics, right? So convergence typically arises in the absence of a central controller. 
and the system is more than the sum of its parts, so the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and emergent properties can be observed only at the system level and not at the micro level. And as we know, there's more uncertainty in the world that we realize, right, in our individual lives. And many times, these emergent properties can be unexpected and often extreme. So then the key question becomes, is blockchain driving technological convergence? Now, I'm a researcher, and I want to be skeptical about it. But turns out there are people who think that it does, that it can be the underlying backbone that would enable technologies like AI, right? Technologies like AR and VR to actually uh, be built upon, particularly in the age where our privacy is, is a big concern. So Outlier Ventures, I actually met uh, Lawrence recently at MIT Blockchain in Action conference just last week. And uh, I think they do a great job in presenting a taxonomy of various technologies, uh, starting from the very uh, simple one, relatively simple one, to the more complex one at the top, right? So data execution uh, and collection through things like AR and VR, drone from data management structures, where uh, distributed ledgers like Hyperledger comes into, and data automation like smart contracts or records, and finally to the very complex tasks like uh, having consensus within the society. I'm not specifically talking about consensus mechanisms within the blockchain uh, terms, but also things like governance, right, which is extremely complex. And, and I know we have a panel later on um, uh, some of these uh, questions. So I think one of the... Um, so there are a lot of people who are actually doing a lot of work on convergence, right? And I think one of, one of the companies that do come to mind is uh, one of my friends at MIT, uh, a company called Endor, which is on um, AI-enabled uh, prediction. Um, and then they're now deploying blockchain in order to ensure that this data can be used and, and is accessible in a distributed way. So what that entails is what I call network thinking. Right, using networks as the basic toolbox and not general equilibrium. Let's take another show of hands here. How many people have taken at least Economics 101? Just, just as a, a minor in bachelors, that would do the trick as well, right? Perfect, so that's at least 50% of the room. So we do know that the way traditional economics works is that the, we study linear systems, right? One plus one is equal to two, but here's the problem with that. The, the links between these nodes, this one plus one, is, is not really accounted for, right? It, it, the interaction effect between two individuals is not accounted for. Um, and that is why, um, and I mentioned here, that the links between the nodes are not the property of any one node. And that is how the system is more than the sum of its parts. So you can ask this question, where are these economic structures which are better suited for a, a more connected world? And so the second idea that I want to talk about is the impact of increasing connectedness on economic structures. So I think what blockchain can enable is a reduction in a lot of these frictions. And, and I wrote this crowdfunding meets blockchain uh, report a couple of years ago. I started my career in the crowdfunding space and really looking at what happens to the market design and liquidity considerations for securities trading a blockchain, which is very different from Think of the public markets, for example, right? And uh, what you see in the public markets is not the true picture of the market because they're market makers who are sitting on both sides of the market, pumping liquidity. And most of the big trades are actually executed in uh, dark pools or alternative trading systems. And, and then there's the central banks uh, that are pumping liquidity. So what you see is not a transparent market. I mean, think about it. If the underlying network structure it moves from a centralized network to a peer-to-peer, a, -peer a hub-and-spoke sort of network. It really is a game changer, and we don't know what are some of these considerations um, in terms of what all it changes, what would happen to the liquidity. But I have done an exploratory study, and uh, I do build on literature on information asymmetries, uh, search and transaction costs, which I think blockchain can reduce. Right? An example would be Uber. The search cost of you finding a ride in the next five minutes that you need it 
uh, was really high in the past unless a company like Uber comes in and builds this platform. So we do know that something as trivial as is the case in, in traditional economics can actually open up new industries altogether. So this is not a, a trivial matter. So a lot of this automation can actually be enabled through smart contracts. And another idea that I think blockchain really helps us with is consolidating fragmented systems. And so a note of warning here would be that consolidation is not synonymous with centralization, right? What consolidation means are different parts talk to each other from Genesis. Uh, what you don't see in the public markets at the moment uh, for if, is that, that it's not the case, right? There's a back-end infrastructure of billions of dollars uh, that actually ensures that these systems uh, do coordinate. And what is needed for that? Well, industry standards. Standards are the key. Now, as we speak here, there's another conference that's happening at University College London, where I'm also a fellow, um, and that's the Technical Committee 307 on blockchain standards. So I think there are eight or nine working groups, and they're discussing uh, industry standards on that. So anyway, I decided to come to Catapult. That says a lot. <laughs> Overall, I think what it does is that it reduces systemic risk. What that means is that risk is, or, or trust is now programmatically embedded into the network, right? And so that means you don't have to worry about trusting the other party, and that reduces what we call counterparty risk. And overall, it reduces the systemic risk uh, within the larger institution, which uh, by definition means too much risk getting concentrated in one part of the system. And that's really what happened during the 2007 and 8 financial crisis. So the final idea that I want to talk about is what's with the revolution? We hear this a lot. Uh, many of you do a lot of these tech conferences. And there is this notion of, there is a sense of we are at something really big. And I think that is the rethinking value, how many of these technologies, uh, particularly blockchain technology, is making us rethink value. Like I mentioned before, I think what it enables is commodification of trust. Um, and the mechanism to achieve this is economic incentives, right? The Bitcoin blockchain works because, well, there's proof of work securing the network. But here's the thing, proof of work is something that works because, because the block reward is actually higher than uh, the cost of mining the block, right? Because the economic incentives of the miners are aligned. It would work as long as these economic incentives are in place and it will stop working when they don't. So the economics of these token economies is, is critical. So that brings me to one of my favorite topics on crypto economics. How many of you have heard about it and want to know more about it? Come on, raise it higher. Excellent. So that's around 80% of the, uh, the room. So, so this has become a bit of a buzzword at the moment. But we do know crypto economics, which is a study of applied cryptography that takes into consideration economic incentives in the system, has not a lot of economics or a lot of cryptography at the moment, right? So I think this definition from Vitalik, who's a co-founder of Ethereum, is, is, uh, is a good place to start, that there are economic incentives in the, in, in the system such that um, you can actually ensure that the nodes in the system take care of or, or have incentives to ensure the desirable properties of the system. But at the same time, cryptography can be used to see back into the past and, and verify that some of these things uh, are, are actually true. So I presented another definition of crypto economics and Hyperledger's blockchain for business online course. We have around 100,000 students who have registered for the course, making it around the biggest course that's out there on blockchain, the most exhaustive one. So for those of you who are looking at the enterprise blockchain solutions, I think this is a very good resource. And, and invite you to have a look. Tokenization of the economy is, is one of the key topics that I've been looking at recently. And um, if you just take a step back and just Google the word token, 
a token is nothing but the representation of a certain quality or a characteristic, right? So there's a lot of debate around utility token versus security token. It's funny because I was at this conference and I was talking to a colleague who said, um, uh, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, I don't really believe in God and, and I'm an atheist. And he said, well, the real question is not whether it's a security token or a utility token, or whether or not God exists, but in fact that whether or not it's a security token or a utility token. And so that really tells you about a lot of debate that's happening, at least in the United States around this, with the SEC uh, currently looking at these tokens. So we've all heard how blockchain enables transfer of value, right? And I think what tokenized assets do is they make us rethink value. And so we wrote what is the first paper on behavioral economics applied to token valuation, um, how uh, value is created tokenized assets. And, and, and we really take a step back and ask, how can value be created out of thin air? In, in quarter one of 2018, the total uh, market cap of uh, the crypto space or all blockchain enabled industries was around $500 billion, right? So it really makes you wonder. So the first Bitcoin transaction um, was actually two pizzas worth $40 at the time. Guess what they're worth now? That's more than 80 million, right? So one perspective is that uh, this guy who actually bought Bitcoin actually uh, did not uh, get the true value of what his Bitcoin was, but we take a, a slightly different view. I think what that transaction really did was it opened a new asset class. It validated the fact that it is a, a measure of, of payments, uh, a measure of, uh, of value, right? So one of the ideas that I want to leave uh, you with and that we explore in the paper is how entire economic systems are, in fact, a word of confidence. In 1973, the United States abandoned the gold standard and they moved to fiat currency. And by the way, I recently learned that over 80% of fiat uh, is in fact just debt. It's not even fiat, right? So what that, what that really says is the government saying, well, trust us, we will give you goods and services worth the value of this number on the currency note. So look at your political institutions, look at social institutions, religion, why doctors wear white coats, why markets work, right? All of this is in fact a vote of confidence. So the question is, how do we perceive and measure value? And that really made us take a step back and look at cognitive psychology as to where a lot of uh, these, the, the understanding about value is coming from. And Daniel Kahneman and Emma Stravisky, and I was talking to a couple of folks yesterday, did some of the, the groundbreaking work on this and um, talk about what are the assumptions or shortcuts or heuristics that the human mind is making while perceiving and measuring value. And the first of them, and we explore in the paper, is familiarity. What is familiar is non-threatening to the human brain. So even if you don't like Coca-Cola, well, you know, you still know it. It's familiar. It cannot be dangerous. And, and that's why marketing really pays off, whether or not you realize it. The second heuristic, and I thought this guy was kind of handsome, is the halo effect. We know that from empirical data from a lot of these ICOs that um, a lot of the people who had the in names of institutions like MIT, like Harvard, or our, our institutions within the industry uh, in their past actually were able to raise a lot more capital and a lot more quickly. So we know that the halo effect works because it builds credibility. The third heuristic, and, and I joined yoga classes recently, is that of intuition. And intuition is nothing else but like we say, 100,000 hours of putting uh, into a, a, new, a new subject and developing expertise. But here's the problem with intuition. We do know that simple models are actually way better in predicting um, a lot of the, the, the data that we have than experts, right? So I'm close to a conclusion here. <laughs> 
So what we do is, I'm going to go very quickly on it, and the paper's out there. It's just been accepted as uh, a chapter in the first book on economics of blockchain. We present a taxonomy of various tokens, uh, and I'm going to skip most of that, and, and we talk about how we can, uh, through understanding the value of networks from the literature so far, we present a framework for token confidence, and we look at key things around markets, around user adoption, uh, adapting Timon's model of entrepreneurship. Um, and that really talks about core things that are important part of your business, right? When you're looking at these ICOs, tokens, at the end of the day, it is about the business. Things like uh, management team and the new model that we present and the new section we add is that of token mechanics. So in the end, in conclusion, I think what it really does is that it's making us rethink the very discipline of economics. I think economic science is up for disruption with blockchain technology. Because if the assumptions of the models break down, well, so do the models. Thank you.